It's 8 o'clock, this is the UK Tonight, I'm Greg Milam. Tonight, three British aid workers among the dead in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. The government has demanded answers. Rishi Sunak has spoken to Benjamin Netanyahu tonight and the Israeli ambassador has been summoned to the Foreign Office. Seven people were killed when their convoy was hit as they left a warehouse where they've been unloading hundreds of tons of aid. Coming up, we'll get the views of a British doctor who's just got home from Gaza, and we'll speak to Amnesty International about what the strike means for aid efforts in the territory and the implications for the Palestinian people. Also tonight, no case to answer. Police in Scotland dismiss complaints about J.K. Rowling after she criticised a group of transgender women on social media and called them men in the first major test of the country's new hate crime laws. As the government defends plans which could criminalise homelessness, a cabinet minister denies that rough sleepers could be arrested just for smelling bad. And First England, now Team GB. Anger over official merchandise featuring a new colour scheme for the Union flag. All that to come and much more on the UK Tonight. We start tonight with the condemnation of Israel over the deaths of seven aid workers in an airstrike in Gaza. Three of those killed were British nationals. Their convoy was hit as they left a warehouse in northern Gaza where they'd been unloading hundreds of tonnes of aid for the Palestinian people. Rishi Sunak has spoken to his Israeli counterpart, Benjamin Netanyahu, tonight to tell him he's appalled at the aid workers' deaths. The UN called their killing the inevitable result of the way this war is being conducted. Our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports. The missile went straight through the roof of the armoured vehicle, shredding the charity's identifying logo, like a dart hitting a bullseye. Further down the road, the two other vehicles in the convoy were picked off, one by one. Three precise hits on three separate cars. All seven passengers were killed, among them three Britons, confirmed by World Central Kitchen, and the British government. Hey, this is Zomi and Chef Olivier. We're at the Jirabala kitchen. Australian Zomi Frankham was also among the dead. Her Prime Minister has demanded answers. Australia expects full accountability for the deaths of aid workers, uh, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, aid workers and those doing humanitarian work and indeed all innocent civilians need to be provided with protection. Their bodies were taken to Al-Aqsa Hospital near Gaza City, where they were identified by colleagues. Israel has now admitted responsibility for the strikes and launched an investigation. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic incident of an unintended strike of our forces on innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war. We're checking this thoroughly, we're in touch with the government and we'll do everything for this not to happen again. The seven aid workers were leaving the charity's warehouse in Deir al-Bala, where they had just unloaded 100 tonnes of aid. The three-car convoy was travelling along this coast road, one of the main highways heading through the strip. Sky News has geolocated the wreckages of the cars to these three locations. As humanitarian workers, we're here trying to do our job, but we are continually being hampered every step of the way. If you put the pieces of the puzzle together, we're not getting enough aid in. We are unable to properly move throughout the Gaza Strip to the, get that aid that we do get in to the people that need it. And while we're doing that, we're at risk of being killed. <laughs> Devastated Palestinian colleagues comforted one another as the news reached them. World Central Kitchen gave out food to Israelis following the October the 7th attacks and has been one of the biggest providers of aid in Gaza during the war. But it has now suspended its operations following the airstrikes last night. And today, aid ships bound for Gaza were turned back to Cyprus. That will have an immediate impact on the thousands who desperately rely on their food. Alistair Bunker, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Well, our chief political correspondent, John Craig, is outside the Foreign Office where the Israeli ambassador was summoned earlier. And John, Rishi Sunak has just spoken to the Israeli Prime Minister. 
Yes, in the last 20 minutes or so, we've heard about that phone call. Sounds as though it was a pretty uh, terse and a pretty angry uh, uh, Rishi Sunak uh, speaking to Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, the PM, according to number 10, said he was appalled by the killing of these aid workers and uh, demanded a thorough and transparent independent investigation. And uh, the Prime Minister said, Far too many aid workers and ordinary civilians have lost their lives in Gaza. The situation is increasingly intolerable, Mr Sunak said. The UK expects to see immediate action by Israel to end restrictions on humanitarian aid, uh, deconflict with the UN and aid agencies, uh, protect civilians and repair vital infrastructure like hospitals and, uh, ho and water networks. So... Um, that uh, was the most recent development, but earlier here at the Foreign Office, the Israeli uh, ambassador in London, that's uh, Sipi uh, Hotoveli, was summoned by Andrew Mitchell, the Deputy Foreign Secretary. And Mr Mitchell said that uh, the, uh, the killing was uh, uh, appalling and uh, he uh, re really read the riot act to the ambassador in a 30-minute meeting. Now, as well as that, David Cameron, who had been enjoying a, a brief Easter holiday, uh, cut that short for a phone call with the Israeli foreign minister, that's Israel Katz. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, the, number, the British government, both the PM, the Foreign Secretary's deputy, Mr Mitchell, pulling out all the stops, really. But it's quite significant that Mr Sunak is now using that word intolerable. And clearly, patience is running out here in the UK and no doubt other nations uh, we heard from Australia no doubt we'll get a similar reaction from the United States as well um, this uh, this killing of these aid workers really has shocked diplomats here and senior politicians like Mr Sunak and David Cameron Lord Cameron and Mr Mitchell and uh, the UK clearly uh, wants uh, answers from Israel and also a complete change of uh, the Israelis approach to protect aid workers in the future and uh, as I say, Mr Sunak, who uh, clearly, his patience is running out, has used the word intolerable tonight to describe the situation in which aid workers, as we heard in Alistair's report, clearly appear to have been targeted deliberately by Israeli forces. John Craig there at the Foreign Office, thank you very much for that. Well, let's get more on this. Uh, I'm joined now by emergency doctor James Smith who's recently returned from working in Gaza, and Carla McLaren, Head of Government Affairs at Amnesty International UK. Thanks to both of you for joining us um, tonight. James Smith, first of all, to you, having been so recently in Gaza, what was your reaction when you heard that news this morning? It's, it's horrific news um, and uh, an, an incredibly tragic event, as, as colleagues have, have mentioned. I think what's worth uh, emphasising here, however, is that the colleagues that have been killed uh, in an Israeli strike uh, in the last 24 hours or so are um, some of more than 200 humanitarian workers that have been killed uh, since October of last year, in addition to more than 400 healthcare workers and, of course, more than 32,000 uh, Palestinians. Um, as, as, a health, as a healthcare worker, as a humanitarian worker who, as you say, has, has worked recently in Gaza, that the, the situation there uh, was intolerable back in October. It's almost unimaginable the conditions that the Palestinian people uh, are currently having to endure. Um, for myself, trying to deliver medical care uh, alongside Palestinian healthcare workers in the Deir al Bala uh, area, uh, it, it was almost impossible to deliver even the most basic forms of care. Uh, when the violence was as intense and as horrific uh, as, as, uh, as the Israeli state had made it at that particular time. And Carla McLaren, um, you heard there that, that, uh, the, the details of that phone call between the Prime Minister and, and the Prime Minister of Israel. What have you made of, of what happened, first of all, but also that, that, that reaction to it, the condemnation that's come? Well, the, the reported circumstances of this particular incident are obviously uh, incredibly distressing. We've got aid workers trying to deliver food in the context of a famine that Israel has manufactured. Children are starving to death, but only 40 miles away there is no shortage of food. And apparently this convoy was hit by multiple strikes. So obviously it's, it's horrific. But as James said, the reality is that this is not an isolated incident. 
more than 200 humanitarian workers have been killed by Israeli forces um, since October. So we, it's essential that we see an independent investigation of this. Targeting humanitarian workers violates international humanitarian law. And to think that Israel can reliably investigate itself on this, as the UK was suggesting earlier, earlier is frankly ridiculous, given the long history of impunity that Israeli authorities have enjoyed. And, you know, we're seeing multiple examples of Israel committing war crimes in this conflict, restricting food and water and fuel to millions, indiscriminate attacks, plausible genocide, according to the top court in the world. We, of course, have Hamas continuing to hold hostages and firing in rockets indiscriminately into Israel. And so it's frankly shameful that we're still not seeing the UK call for an immediate ceasefire. We're still seeing the UK sell arms to Israel. We're still seeing the UK trade in settlement goods. Settlements are, of course, also a war crime. So what will it take for the UK to take actual action to stop this bloodshed? The Israeli government has said, as we know, that this was an unintended strike, that it will be investigated. But um, James Smith, you, you talked a little bit about it there. Practically, for those working in those conditions, trying to bring aid or, or medical help as you were, what is it like day to day? What, what are the conditions? How, how are people able to even try to deliver that aid in, in those conditions? I mean, I I impossible, Greg, uh, uh, and, and deeply, deeply frightening. I mean, we were all fearful all of the time. Um, we knew that the very basic assurances that we had received of uh, what folks refer to as deconfliction, so deconflicted locations, deconflicted travel, we knew that that wasn't uh, worth the paper that it was written on. Um, the building that we were staying in um, some time after our team had left was actually hit also by an Israeli airstrike. Um, the, the details of which are publicly available. Several individuals in the team that followed us were, were injured, some of them severely. Um, I, I think the other thing that's really worth emphasizing here is that Israel boasts one of the most advanced militaries in the world, and along with that, some of the most advanced military technology, uh, which has been uh, unfortunately tried and tested on the Palestinian people over several decades. Uh, for, the, for the Israeli state to suggest that any of their violent actions are unintentional is, is really hard to, to, to believe at, at, at this stage. Carla McLaren, there's a practical issue here as well, isn't there? We've already seen World Central Kitchen pause their operations, other organisations as well, uh, considering whether they can carry on. That has a practical implication for those people who, who are relying on, on the, the services they're providing there. Absolutely, and that's what's incredibly worrying and, and distressing. I mean, as you said, we've had this attack that 200 humanitarian aid workers killed. We've had the attack on a Medicine Sans Frontier compound that you at Sky have reported on recently. There was an attack on a medical aid for Palestinian compound in January. Um, the delivery of aid is almost impossible. And that's in the context of the International Court of Justice having ordered Israel to deliver aid and to allow aid unpeded into Gaza. And under international law, Israel as the occupying force has an obligation, a legal obligation, to ensure that aid can be delivered. So we need to see the international community take action now. The, the, the conflict has been raging on. And as James said, th this was intolerable months ago. We have to see concrete consequences when international humanitarian law is breached, as we are seeing happen repeatedly. We must see an arms embargo. We must see the UK stop selling arms to, to Israel. We must see multilateral sanctions. There are tools at the disposal of the international community and they now need to be imposed. James, we've, we've been seeing images um, as we're talking to you of some of the work you've been doing on, on the ground there. Is, is there any hope here that, the, that this could be a significant moment, that the, the level of condemnation uh, that's coming from around the world uh, could, could bring about some kind of change uh, on the ground? I mean, I think that the, the global sort of geopolitical climate is such that uh, many world leaders uh, only seem to pay attention when those affected are not Palestinians. And it appears that that's what we're seeing now with the level and intensity of, of condemnation certainly coming from the UK government uh, when it's tragically British lives that are lost and, and not Palestinian lives. 
uh, we can only hope that this will bring about uh, or, or that this will usher along an end to the violence, which, uh, as I think we've, we've emphasised in the course of the last couple of minutes, is, is many months uh, overdue. Carla McLaren, do, do you think there is any, any sense that any government outside of Israel, be it the US, be it the UK, for, for what you're calling for can have an impact, whether, whether that the voice of the UK is significant in, in bringing about any change in directional policy? I think the UK is absolutely significant as a key ally of Israel, and the UK should be working with the US and others um, in the inter international community to actually ensure that there are concrete consequences, that there are actions taken to deter further breaches of international humanitarian law. We've seen, obviously, just last week that Netanyahu has vowed to, co to continue with an offensive in Rafa, which would be absolutely catastrophic. We continue to hear condemnations from the UK government, but where are the actual actions to stop Israel from continuing? Where's the arms embargo? Where are the multilateral sanctions? We need to move from words of condemnation to actions with concrete consequences to ensure that Israel cannot continue because it is decades of impunity for violations of human rights and international humanitarian law that has led us to where we are today. James Smith, you, you've been there, you've worked there, you're, you're recently back. Do, do you think scenes like those that we've seen today and, and incidents like this will make those who have been willing to go uh, think twice about, about going to Gaza, carrying out that, that kind of work, obviously with, with the cost that brings to the Palestinian people? I would say that there is probably nowhere uh, on earth right now that is more unsafe uh, for uh, not only health and, and humanitarian workers, but of, of course for, for, for human beings and, and, and for the Palestinian people uh, who, who are bearing the brunt of this. I think that people uh, and organisations will feel uh, more reluctant. Uh, as you've already reported, uh, the, the, the um, latest supplies that are food aid that were moving via the, the sea corridor have, have turned back towards Cyprus. Uh, there is at least one NGO that, have, uh, that has already uh, reported that they will be suspending their operations. Uh, other organisations have done the same in the wake of attacks against uh, their staff and their facilities over the course of the last couple of months. Um, and I would use this opportunity really to emphasise that n really no amount of humanitarian access, no amount of humanitarian service provision will be able to adequately meet the needs of the Palestinian people while the violence continues. Um, and this is why humanitarian organisations have been consistent since day zero in saying that what we need is a ceasefire and humanitarian access. We can't focus exclusively on uh, bringing in humanitarian materials, emergency medical teams, uh, while Israel continues to, to, to commit such atrocities. It's just impossible to work uh, under these conditions. James Smith and Carla McLaren from Amnesty International, thanks very much for your time with us this evening. Now, police in Scotland say J.K. Rowling has no case to answer over a string of tweets yesterday. In the first major test of the country's new hate crime laws, the author criticised a group of transgender women and called them men. After the police announced she would face no action, she tweeted, I hope every woman in Scotland who wishes to speak up for the reality and importance of biological sex will be reassured by this announcement. And I trust that all women, irrespective of profile or financial means, will be treated equally under the law. In a separate post, she said, if they go after any woman for simply calling a man a man, I'll repeat that woman's words and they can charge us both at once. Well, earlier she'd received the backing of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who said he supports the right to free speech. Well, look, we're not going to do anything like that here in England. I, I, you know, we should not be criminalising people saying common sense things about biological sex. Clearly that isn't right. We have a proud tradition of free speech, and I think it just shows whether it's the SNP or the Labour. These are the wrong set of priorities for the country. I'm focused on delivering on the things that really matter to people. So do you support J.K. Rowling's approach? It is, well, it's not, not right for me to comment on police matters, individual matters, but what I do support very strongly are people's rights to free speech and nobody should be criminalised for saying common sense things about biological sex. But one of the women criticised by JK Rowling, the TV presenter India Willoughby, accused the police of green lighting hate against trans women. To me, from where I'm 
sitting and and being one of the uh, principal targets, um, I feel like she was trying to demonise me, besmirch me, put me alongside bad people because she wants the public and society across the world to view people like me, people who are trans, as a threat. The police need to buck their ideas up and start making prosecutions and protecting the trans community. We've already had Brianna Jai. We do not want another one to either a child or an adult. Still to come on the UK tonight. First England, now Team GB. Anger over the Olympic merchandise featuring a new colour scheme for the Union flag. A minister is forced to deny that rough sleepers could be arrested just for smelling bad as the government tries to fight off a rebellion over its plans to tackle homelessness. And Cave Cleanup, the very unusual Welsh tourist attraction left in a terrible state after it was made famous by Instagram. It's one of the most dramatic sights in nature. A total solar eclipse, when day turns to night in a rare and spectacular sight. Join millions of people across Mexico, the US and Canada and watch the total eclipse live in a special programme on Sky News. We're here to talk about climate change okay, tell and, and wines. There's a recent um, article, I think, in The Times that came out, and it was saying that in, you know, in sort of as, as little as 20 to 30 years, we won't be drinking Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. We'll be drinking completely different grapes. Don't be because, ridiculous. Yeah, apparently so. I think there's a lot of Where's scaremongering, but this is from the Loire. OK. So, cool climate, you know, France. This is the spiritual home of Sauvignon Blanc. Absolutely yeah. lovely. This is from England, so this is Sussex, East Sussex. Oh, sparkling. Yeah, sparkling. But it goes to show, you know, with, with climate change, it's all about countries like it's England. It's cold as well. It's very, yeah. <laughs> Definitely the temperatures are going up and it's been proven, but it's saying, you know, it, it's shocking the way, you know, they're saying in, in sort of by 2070, it could be as much as three degrees hotter than it is now. Goodness. And so what the does end that of... mean for wines like this? So ones like this, so, so we'll be this looking at other... This is from France. This is from France. Yeah. So we'll be looking at potentially other grapes being grown in France. So more Mediterranean varieties, for example, who are better suited to more arid conditions, Greek varieties, so anything. So the Sauvignon Blancs and the Chardonnay... Santorini, Chardonnay's... actually, that's the... Oh, my goodness, you're absolutely right, mm. because that's one of the most hostile environments for growing grapes. Mm. And they've nailed it with it. Acetico, you know, lovely, beautiful white wines. Mm. So I think it's probably that. So the Americas, California, instead of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, we'll be drinking things like, you know, Torrigo Nacional from Portugal, which is one of the key ingredients in port, for example. So reds as well. Mm -hmm. So the thing with, you know, the hotter it gets, the higher the sugars in the grapes, so higher the alcohol as well, but the lower the acidity, which is not what you want. You want something with, even for reds, you want something with a good acidity because it's essentially the structure of the wine. So you, and you don't want the alcohols to be too high. Welcome back. Team GB has insisted that athletes at this summer's Olympics will have the traditional union flag on their kits after a row over some of the merchandise available on the team's website. Flags, bunting and water bottles, which all feature a new colour scheme for the union flag, are on sale on the site, but the athletes are expected to wear more traditional colours in Paris this summer, where well, the president of the Flag Institute, Malcolm Farrow, joins me now. Good evening, Malcolm. Thanks for joining us. I think I might know the answer to this question already, but what do you make of... Uh, these changes to the colour scheme? Not a lot. <laughs> if you want the polite answer, I thoroughly disapprove. Uh, there's nothing whatever wrong 
in having a multicolored design like that. If it's for a dress, a bedspread, a cushion cover, or some other fancy bit of material, that's, that's all right. But this is not that, is it? It's a flag. They call it a flag. They call it a Union Jack supporters flag. It is not a flag, and it's uh, making a mockery of our national flag. And you should never, ever make a mockery of national symbols, which in any country and every country are extremely important. So it's wrong, and they shouldn't have done it. Now, the design agency behind this says it, it's all about making it flexible, more uh, accessible to, to new generations. Uh, they point out that France, the USA, have red, white and blue as well. Isn't that a fair argument? No, it's absolute rubbish. Uh, a very large number of flags throughout the world have red, white and blue in their colours in various different arrangements. Uh, and uh, well, they're, they're just talking absolute gobbledygook. And they are completely failing to understand culture, history and tradition. And symbols are extremely important to people. And it's very, very wrong to muck about with people's revered symbols. That particular symbol, which is one of the oldest flags in the world, uh, is a flag that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have fought and died under to protect the freedom that we'd enjoy in our, in, in our liberal democracy. There are people today, as we well know, running away, escaping from dictatorial regimes to come to live here under the safety of that symbol, of that flag. And they, they, all they're doing really is to insult, uh, insult our history and traditions. I don't want to minimise the Flag Institute. Obviously, you feel very strongly about this, but do you accept that for a lot of people in, the, in this country, it won't mean as much, that they won't be as bothered about these kinds of changes as, as you are? Uh, y yes, I can see what you say up to a point, and, and, and that is a problem that we have because uh, our national symbols are not generally taught to people as in, in school. I was never taught about our national symbols in school, and it's completely uh, correct that symbols, whether whatever we think about them, are very important to people. Look how wrong the Germans got a symbol of simply putting some numbers on a shirt. They got that very badly wrong just, just today, I saw in the newspaper, because they misused the symbol, which was completely disgraceful. So uh, because we're not taught about symbols, we take our flag for granted far too often, and we do not treat it with the respect and dignity that it deserves. Because one thing about that flag, above all others, it is owned by all of us, and whatever our background, whatever our, our colour, creed, religion, traditions, history, or whatever else, we can all join hands beneath that red, white, and blue Union Jack and know it, it, we share it and it unites us all. That's why it's important. Well, if we go back to 2012 and the Olympics then, uh, there, there was a, a, a similar discussion about the, the, the kit that was designed by Stella McCartney. It was certainly more blue than uh, red, white, and blue. More Scottish than British, one of the athletes uh, said back then. Um, isn't this just a fact of life? This has always happened and will, will continue to happen when you've got sports companies making kits like this. Well, I suppose it, it, up to a point, uh, what, what you say is correct. Uh, but uh, what, what we're looking at on the screen now is, uh, is kit. It's not a flag. Uh, and what we were talking about in this particular interview is a flag. And it's being made as a flag. And it's being made to be waved and flown as a flag. And that's where they got it wrong. If they'd left it just as a material design, uh, they would not have got it so wrong. And they, they'd have escaped. It's, it, this, is, this argument is very similar to the one just the other day about the collar of the England football team's shirt, where they took the English flag, St George's Cross, and mucked about with that. They had no business doing that. Uh, it's a flag, and it's a red cross on a white background, and they should have left it with that. The, the, the cross that they produced, which is now on the screen, uh, is a perfectly, uh, perfectly OK design if it's used for something else, like on a, I don't know, a, a, a dress again, got dresses on the brain. Um, but it's not a flag, and it should not be uh, purport to be a flag. You're right, Malcolm Farrow, it's not the first time we've discussed this. It won't be the last, I'm sure, but thanks very Probably much for not. taking the time to join us uh, tonight. Thank you. Now, a Cabinet Minister has told Sky News that homeless people should not be arrested for smelling bad amid a growing backlash against the government's criminal justice bill. More than 40 Tory MPs are expected to vote against the bill, which will give police the power to fine or move on anyone causing a nuisance or damage, including an excessive smell. Sky's Kay Burley challenged the Education Secretary on that this morning.
What about if they smell? Sorry. The bill states that rough sleepers might be considered a nuisance if there's an excessive smell. So if you smell, you might be arrested. Well, I mean, I think the most important thing, as it's I say, funny. is to make sure we help people off the streets. No, I'm not saying it's funny, and I'm, I'm saying the most important thing is to help people off the streets. That's Should why people be arrested if they smell into this. Well, no, people should not be arrested just uh, if they smell. Why does the bill then say that rough sleepers might be considered a nuisance if there's an excessive smell? How ridiculous, some might say, to put that in the bill. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't looked at that uh, detail of it. But, I mean, I guess the word is excessive and I don't, know, uh, I don't know what they mean then. But it's really about making sure that we support people but also we make sure that, um, you know, people feel safe in, uh, on our streets. Still to come on the UK tonight, we'll be discussing the artificial pancreas set for a world first rollout on the NHS in England. Welcome back to the UK tonight. People living with type 1 diabetes in England are set to receive what's been dubbed an artificial pancreas in a world-first initiative being rolled out by the NHS. The device continually monitors a person's blood glucose, then automatically adjusts the amount of insulin given to them through a pump. Campaigners say it could make a life-changing difference to the quarter of a million people living with type 1 diabetes in England. Amelia Harper reports. Make them. For 44 years, Les Watson has juggled an active life in Devon with his type 1 diabetes. But it's just got easier. With new technology, the NHS is calling an artificial pancreas. 
The thin blue line is how much insulin I've been getting. A system involving a phone, a monitoring patch and a grey insulin pump continuously monitors blood glucose levels, automatically adjusting the dose. This is an insulin pump. And it puts an end to manual injections and the need to draw blood. There are three components and all three components need to be wirelessly connected. The biggest benefit that I can see is the mental load uh, of, of handling uh, type 1 diabetes with systems like this is just reduced tremendously. I can sleep at night. There are currently over 269,000 people living in England with type 1 diabetes. NHS England spends around £10 billion a year and around 10% of its entire budget on identifying and treating the condition. The artificial pancreas technology will be rolled out over the next five years across England. To identify those who are eligible, £2.5 million has been given to local health services. It's hoped it will help tens of thousands of children and adults. This is pretty much at as much as a cutting edge as it can be. So to put it in context, of all the people who have type 1 diabetes in England and Wales, the criteria would make about 78 to 80 percent of people eligible. So that's pretty big as we go forwards. The chief executive of Diabetes UK says diabetes is a tough and relentless condition, but these systems make a significant life-changing difference. This really is a landmark moment and we'll be working with the NHS and others to ensure a fair rollout that reaches people as quickly as possible. This technology should reduce the stress around managing diabetes and for those already benefiting, it's meant keeping a lid on blood sugar levels just got easier. Amelia Harper, Sky News. Well, let's get more on this now. Dr Partha Carr joins me now. You saw him in that report there. He's NHS England's type 1 diabetes and technology lead. And Chris Bright also joins me. He's got type 1 diabetes and has been using the artificial pancreas for the last six months. Good evening to both of you and thanks for joining us. Chris, I guess the first question has to go to you. Uh, what difference has it made to you? It's made a huge difference. It's... Um completely changed the way that I manage type 1 diabetes and as we've just seen in the VT it's really reduced the burden that I go through every single day whilst um, trying to, to manage what is a, a relentless condition. And Professor Carl what does it mean to get to this to this point how much work has gone into this and, and what is the significance of this moment? So I think you know a lot of people Ought to take credit for it. You know, charities like JDRF, uh, professors like Roman Hoverka, all the work they have done. This is a culmination of all that work. It's taken a long time for us to get there, many people behind it, and it's wonderful to see it happen. And the way I describe it is to say it's probably the best thing science can provide at the moment for type 1 diabetes beyond a cure. And I think that's as cutting edge as it gets. A uh, huge change in quality of life apart from all the outcomes and stuff. And you've heard from Chris and Les before that. Uh, I can't put it, put it any better. I don't have type 1 diabetes, but let's put it this way. It's, we're very proud of having got to this point. And Chris, for those who, who don't know, just explain a bit about what type 1 diabetes meant in terms of lifestyle and managing that, that condition before this, this technology. So before this technology came about, I was injecting a number of times uh, across a day, um, anything between probably four and eight times a day, I'd be dosing insulin based on different circumstances that I found myself. Um, in previous years, before the development of continuous glucose monitoring and the patches that we see now that people wear often on their arms, I would have been finger prick testing and needing to do probably again between maybe six to 12 finger pricks a day to, to manage my blood glucose levels and learn what they are. So to have this system in place now where I've come from all of that input physically there to now where I just wear the patch on my arm and an insulin pump which is essentially talking to each other to make my life easier and take away less of that input as well as some of the decisions and the thinking that I needed to, to put into place has just been it's just a huge step forward and, and technology has, has taken us to a place now where uh, the burden has just been relinquished dramatically for, for me and, and hopefully now so many of us with type 1. I know you, you play a lot of sport. I mean, with, with this new system, does that have any impact at all on, on how you live day to day com compared to what it was like before? So I, when it comes to sport, 
um, I suppose it, it, I still require quite a bit of input and thinking around it. Um, it still needs some input. It's not the, the perfect cure. It's not where we've taken away everything to do with type 1 diabetes. So I still have to put some information into it. I still have to plan for sport and physical activity, just as I was before. But what it has done is taken away a lot of thinking around it. So actually, I spend less time thinking about type 1 going into the game and the sport and actually get more time thinking about the sport itself, which, again, hugely important to being able to, to try and perform and enjoy the things that you, you, know, you love doing. Um, away from obviously managing a, a, a chronic health condition like type 1 diabetes. And Dr Carr, obviously great result for, for Chris. Um, in terms of rolling this out to that quarter of a million people, 30,000, 29,000 of them children, what is, what is the process? How quickly can, can that happen to give other people the, the chance, as, as Chris is talking about there? So we got a five-year implementation plan, which makes sense, because if you look at the success we've had with continuous glucose monitors, that's also taken us about five years. And the reason for that is, it's not just a technology just put on people and forget about it. You've got training needs for the staff, you've got training needs for the people living with type 1 diabetes. And of course, you know, the NHS will roll it out in its time. So I think five years is a very good estimate of where we get to. So to everybody listening who's thinking, shall I get it tomorrow? I think I would say that every... Uh, units in every center has been asked to have a priority list, go through children, women trying for pregnancy. And then I think within five years, we aim to get to everybody who should hopefully be getting this technology. And Chris, when it comes to the, the emotional side of this, obviously those things you talked about that were facts of life every, every minute of every day, what is it like when, you, when, when those are taken away, when you're not having to think of quite so much in, in how you live your everyday life? It's quite emotional. I think for, for so many people, for me, it's been nearly 25 years. It's going to just change the way you think, the way you feel, the, the space that it frees up to focus on other things which are really important. It's just quite a, an emotional thing for us to, to deal with. And it gives me more space and more energy to, to focus on other things. It's brought a lot of positivity it's allowed freedom. And I think that's what a lot of people would hope for and would shoot for with type one diabetes for the future is, is the freedom to, to live more and focus less on, on this condition. And all of that combined together is just amazing to feel that way. And yeah, it's, it's emotional, I think, is a, it's probably a, a really good way of summarizing all that. And it, it is so amazing. Dr. Carr, you, you talked about the, the significance of the moment, and obviously we, we hear a lot about the NHS that's not so positive uh, these days. This is very specific technology, but, but what does it tell us about how technology in addressing diabetes in this case is, is making a difference and potentially for other conditions as well? Um, no, this is absolutely a bona fide good story. Uh, we are pretty much at the edge of, or the cutting edge of uh, globally where we are. I think this is a really good example of what technology can do to actually tackle the issue of prevention. And to me, the biggest thing is it's a marker of improving your quality of life. I'll probably leave all the audience with one particular quote that I love giving, which I've heard from one of the parents, which said less beeping and more sleeping, which probably defines a lot. Because this is not just about those with type 1 diabetes. It's about their carers, their spouse, their parents. It makes a big difference. You're changing the whole dynamics around family structures uh, by just and it's a, I don't have type 1 diabetes, but I always say it's a very unremitting and unforgiving condition. And I think anything we can do with technology to make life a little bit better, a little bit more manageable, will give outcomes. And uh, that's what we've seen previously with continuous glucose monitors. I'm absolutely confident it will be the same with this technology. Well, good news indeed. Dr. Parthakar and Chris Bright, thanks very much to both of you for joining us here tonight. Thank you. Some breaking news now, and detectives investigating the stabbing of a journalist at a dissident Iranian TV channel in London believe the three suspects fled the country without, within hours of the attack. Scotland Yard says Puriya Zarati was attacked outside his London home by two men who left the scene in a car driven by a third male. The vehicle was abandoned nearby, and the men travelled then to Heathrow Airport and left the UK. Mr Zarati was discharged from hospital yesterday afternoon. The TV channel he works for, Iran International, has been declared a terrorist organisation by the Iranian regime. That breaking news there. And coming up on the UK tonight, I'll be speaking to the Welsh caver who's helped to clean up a very unusual tourist attraction after it was made famous by Instagram. 
In sport, there are big money worries for Premier League chasing Leicester City. We'll look at the impact of their latest financial results. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back to the UK tonight. Coming up, the unusual Welsh car cave given a clean-up. But first, Teddy is here with uh, the sport the evening. Good evening, um, Greg. And Leicester City. Uh, more financial problems potentially facing a club heading for the Premiership. Well, they're hoping to get back to the Premier League at the first time of asking. Real shock to get relegation last season, which has partly caused their financial problems. So they're currently third in the table in the Championship. If they win their game in hand, they will go first, which is that automatic promotion spot, one of two places to go up. But yeah, they announced today £89.7 million losses for the 2022-23 season, which was their last season in the Premier League. They'd anticipated the Chief Executive, Suzanne Whelan, says would have been a lot higher finish because they'd finished fifth, fifth and eighth in consecutive seasons. So they budgeted for more. Didn't happen. Didn't get any European revenue. So it's a big loss for Leicester City. £215 million across three campaigns. And if you think under the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules, they're only allowed to use, uh, lose £105 million over three years, which you can see Everton, Nottingham Forest and the Premier League have been deducted points. The caveat here is this isn't profit and sustainability figures. There'll be numbers that they can add back in the parlance to this. Uh, things like uh, the investment in the women's team, investment in the academy, uh, depreciation on some of their players. But they sold £78 million worth of, of players in the summer, but still in a bit of financial trouble. Although we should say that they're not under any threat because King Power, their owners, technically are very happy at, at, at covering these losses. It's just under the rules puts them in a different difficult spot as they vie for that promotion. Well, you mentioned Everton and Forest. Could it mean a points deduction for Leicester? Well, yeah, in the Championship currently, 12, de uh, 12 um, days ago, they were under a charge from the Premier League, under profit and sustainability rules. The EFL currently in the Championship is their governing body. They're looking into them. Leicester, in an unprecedented move, have actually opened legal cases against both the Premier League and EFL. So a lot of clubs like Nottingham Forest and Everton will be looking at that for any precedent that might be formed. But at the moment, it could be a points deduction. They'll be hoping Susan Wheeler, the chief executive, said they have to re-establish themselves as a Premier League side. So that's what Leicester are trying to do. We'll see if they can do that in the coming weeks and what happens off the field as well. But certainly £215 million loss is not great over three campaigns. Meanwhile, Leicester trying to get back in the Premier League. We've got five games to update you on tonight. 
This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. I never really thought it was anything other than the norm until I got to like 24, 25. I was spending so much of my day just worrying about a certain way I was doing everything I was doing. It would take up so much of your day, add extra stress and extra worry to your life. When were you first diagnosed with OCD? What, what kind of led to the diagnosis? Throughout my whole childhood I would, I would have to do certain things to, to feel, feel okay or to feel safe or for my my friends and family and loved ones to, for me to have like um, peace of mind that nothing bad was going to happen or anything like that. There'd always be so many different things that I'd have to do to like, sort of like a checklist. Never really spoke about it with anyone else, but I just thought I just thought that was something you do. It wasn't until I mentioned it to a couple of people when I when I was playing extra Chiefs and they said, yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit weird. Like you shouldn't be doing that. What kind of things were you doing or thinking? So there's a light switch on the wall there. I'd have to click it the right way. I don't know how you describe the right way, but to me there was a right and a wrong way to click a light switch on and off. If I didn't do it right, I had to do it a certain amount of times. If, and if I didn't do it right on the final one, I had to do it more more times. Getting changed, I had to tap my toes on the floor before I put my socks on. Left foot first, right foot second, always. I had a certain order of getting changed. I had a bedtime routine, it took me about an hour to get to bed. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Thanks, Teddy. Now, we always like to leave you with something weird or wonderful here on the UK tonight, and this next story definitely falls into that weird category. A very unusual Welsh tourist attraction has been given a clean-up after it was made famous by Instagram. The Gwynedd Car Cave, also known as the Cavern of Lost Souls, is an old flooded slate mine in North Wales and has become a popular spot for photographers. But now cavers are worried rubbish being left behind is ruining the attraction, and they've decided to do something about it. Well, let's speak to one of them now. James Davis joins me. Thanks very much for, for talking to us. First of all, it's, it's an extraordinary place. Just tell us a little bit about what's down there. Well, there's um, the pile of cars that were pushed in from above uh, back in the 70s, well, 60s and 70s. Uh, the main working is flooded, but uh, apparently the cars go way down, probably a couple of hundred feet. Uh, there's two caverns, um, and the first one was covered in graffiti. So that's some of some of the, the mess you found down there. I mean, we can see these pictures now. It's I mean, it's not an easy place to get to, is it? Just, just tell us how you get down there uh, in the first place. Well, you have to you enter in through a flooded um, adit, a tunnel, and then you come into the first chamber. Where you've got a, um, say, uh, an eighty-foot cliff, a cliff face where you have to scale down. Um, there's ledges and um, drops you have to climb down, but we set ladders up, to make it a bit easier, um, and to get the stuff out. Yeah, just just looking at the pictures. I mean, you'd have to be. You have to be a. You would think you'd have to be a caver to be able to, to make it down there. W were you surprised that, it seems other people who've seen those pictures have have been trying themselves to to get in there and, and succeeding by the look of it. Yeah, it's crazy how some people get in there. We, we've, the first time I went there, we encountered somebody wearing sandals and, <laughs> um, yeah, people go completely unprepared. I think we and, also uh, found dinghies as well, or, or, or inflatables, when you went in to, to do this clean-up. Just talk a bit about what, what you tried to do with that, with that clean-up. Um, well, to try and, um, yeah, preserve it for years to come. Um, yeah, what's your... I mean, th those people who go in, I, it's it's... It's been put at the door of, of Instagrammers, isn't it, who've seen those images and wanted to go and get these pictures um, themselves. What's your message to, to people who, who have seen those pictures and think they want to, to give it a go themselves? 
Well, it's a, you want to leave it how you find it. You go because you like the look of the place. I don't see the point of leaving all the rubbish and trashing it. Um, yeah, I know when it was first found, there was a lot of there were a lot of questions about how it all ended up down there in the first place. What's your what's your theory about? I mean, cars and television sets and all kinds of things um, down the bottom of that that mine shaft. What's your theory about how it all got there? Well, I think back in the what well, back in the day, you had to pay to scrap um, get rid of scrap cars, so. A lot of the locals used to dump them in quarries and or bury them. Are you planning was, to go back um, down there? We'll probably go back down. There was a bit more graffiti to take off. It was um, some of the harder stuff to take off, but hopefully it'll stay like it now. Yeah, well, it's it's good work and um, and well done for doing it. It's an extraordinary place, and those those pictures are remarkable. James Davis, thanks very much for taking the time to talk yep. to us tonight about the Cavern of Lost Souls. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're well, time for a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, there'll be showers or longer spells of rain this week with unseasonably strong winds expected over the weekend. Donegal, Northern Ireland and southern and western Scotland and the far north of England look mainly dry this evening. Elsewhere, there'll be outbreaks of rain heavy in places. Rain will move further north tonight while lingering across eastern Scotland, but low cloud and a few showers will follow to Ireland and southern Britain. It'll be mild overall, but chilly in the far north with snow on the Grampians. It'll be windy in places too. The rain will continue to edge northwards tomorrow morning, merging with the rain already across eastern Scotland, but the far northwest looks fine. Elsewhere, there'll be more in the way of brightness, but there'll be a risk of showers too, some thundery for northern, central and eastern England. It'll be mainly mild for many again, chilly in the far north. Northern Ireland and Donegal will be mainly dry though through the afternoon and showers in the south will fade before more rain reaches the southwest later on. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. That's all from the UK tonight. You can catch up on all the highlights on our web page. Just scan the QR code on your screen and you can share your thoughts with us there too. We'll be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. See you then. <laughs>